Good evening, and thank you very much for joining us. It is great to see this packed house here this evening uh, for this great candidate forum. Uh, my name is Steve Hammond. I'm with WBOC, and I will be serving as your moderator this evening. Um, we are here to hear the candidates for the Maryland Senate District 38, representing Wicomico, Worcester, and Somerset counties. With us tonight, we have the incumbent, State Senator Jim Mathias. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And the challenger, Delegate Mary Beth Carroza. And we've all got that applause out of our system, right? <laughs> I hope so. Um, we'd like to thank Salisbury University for hosting this event, as well as the sponsors of tonight's forum, PACE, the Institute for Public Affairs and Civic Engagement at Salisbury University, the Salisbury Area Chamber of Commerce, and the Greater Salisbury Committee. Let's give them a round of applause. A lot of work went into this. Those three organizations believe strongly that civility in the public discourse is very important and it is in that spirit that tonight's event is being held. So as I said, I will be moderating tonight. We have three panelists who will be with us asking the questions. First off, we have Dorian Rogers. <laughs> Dorian is a freshman political science major from Clarksville, Maryland. Dorian, welcome. Next up, we have Bill Chambers, the president and CEO of the Salisbury Area Chamber of Commerce. There you go. And then we have Mike Dunn, the president and CEO of the Greater Salisbury Committee. They will be asking the questions. Uh, we may have some follow-up. I may have some follow-up. We'll just see how it goes. Um, at the conclusion of the formal candidate questions, of which there are a lot of them, uh, there's a possibility, if time permits, that we will take some questions from the audience. Please fill out the three by five index cards that are available in the seating area, and representatives from PACE will swing by to pick them up. They have their hands up off to the side. Again, we have a lot of questions, and we may not get to yours. We'll see how it goes. Each candidate will be given two minutes to offer opening remarks. They will be given a maximum of two minutes to answer the panelists' questions, and then there will be one minute for a closing statement. We have people up front here to uh, work the timers and let the candidates know where they stand on time. Uh, the incumbent will go first with opening rem remarks, and will go first in closing remarks. Uh, we will alternate who goes first when it comes to answering questions. Now, we've got all the housekeeping out of the way, so let's begin with an opening statement from Senator Jim Mathias. Uh, thank you, good evening, everyone. I appreciate you being here tonight, and uh, clearly thanks for the Greater Salisbury Committee, Salisbury Chamber, and PACE, but most importantly, take a look around. You're the Eastern Shore, and that's what we're here for tonight, is to make the Eastern Shore better. Quite frankly, I appreciate the opportunity tonight to let you know who I am, who I am. Who I am, I'm a dad, I'm a neighbor, I'm a grandfather, I'm a taxpayer, I'm a homeowner. That's who I am, I'm a volunteer, volunteer fire company, career, Ocean City volunteer. Who I'm not, I'm not who you see in the mailbox. I'm not who you see in the mailbox, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not in the pocket or the hand of the majority party. From the very beginning, when we went to Annapolis, we went for one thing, we didn't go as a D or an I, we went as an Eastern Shore person. We went to make the Eastern Shore better. And tonight, as we come together, I want to let you know who we will be, who we will continue to be, a better Eastern Shore. If you look at what this college was and how we've grown, we are so fortunate to have two universities, University of System of Maryland, right here, SU, UMES, new facilities, new burgeoning, Warwick Community College. We're training for the next generation. That's who I am, that's who I'm not, and that's who we will be. I ask you tonight for your vote to allow us to continue to grow together, to continue to succeed together, succeed together. and I thank you so much for being here. Opening remarks now from Delegate Mary Beth Carroza. I'm very humbled to stand before you tonight, and I thank God, and I thank my parents, and I'm thankful to live in a country where we can actually have this free debate and free elections. 
I am excited to serve all of District 38, Somerset, Worcester, and Wicomico. Four years ago, I was elected as a delegate, and Larry Hogan was elected as governor. And if you look at the direction of the shore in the past four years, the focus on job growth and economic development, the partnerships that have been made and strengthened at the local level, we are on the right path. And over the past two years, I've been encouraged to run for the State Senate to build those partnerships, to strengthen them. And for the past four years, I have been a leader in the area of job growth, tax relief, career trade technology education, reversing the heroin opioid epidemic by working with our local partners. It's on me. I'm the one seeking a promotion in public service. I'm out there every day. I've been out there for more than two years, actually starting back when I first ran for delegate. And I listen to my constituents. And I base my decisions on the priorities of the shore. And I can tell you that Governor Larry Hogan has been focused on our shore priorities. And I have been his partner every step of the way, which is why he has fully endorsed me. I'm here tonight to tell you that Governor Larry Hogan needs to be reelected, and I need to be sent to the state senator, Senate so I can be a stronger voice for the shore. That's what I will do. I will continue my constituent service, and I will fight for the shore priorities. Thank you. Our first question this evening from SU student Dorian Rogers uh, for Senator Jim Mathias, who'll go first. Welcome. Um, let us start by asking each of you to name your top two priorities, if elected or reelected, to represent District 38 in the state Senate. Well, my top priority is, if you look around, is to continue to grow our strongest asset, and, and that's our families. When you look around, uh, when I grew up on a Sunday afternoon, I went to my grandmother's home for dinner. And uh, by 4 or 5 o'clock, the family was all together. I want to make sure that those opportunities are here for our families. Uh, you know, we talked about the brain drain. We talk about the folks that have to go elsewhere to find careers. I'm here to make sure that those careers happen. Burgeoning career down at Wallops Island with technology and protecting our cornerstone industries of agriculture, our commercial watermen, tourism, small business. That's number one. Number two, to make absolutely certain that Rural health care delivery is here. You know, when people say, uh, why do you come? When you ask the question, are realtors, I'm endorsed by the Maryland Association of Realtors. Two top questions. Health care. Tell me about your health care. Tell me about your education. And I'm here to make sure that uh, in this challenging world, when that we continue to improve and deliver our health care. So that's what I look for uh, to make sure my continued priorities. I've been a leader in those areas, and I'm going to continue to be. Thank you. All right, everybody. I appreciate your passion. I'm going to ask everybody to hold their applause. We'll save it for the end. And let's, uh, let's get some questions and answers in. Delegate Carosa, you respond to that question, please. Thank you. My two top issues would be jobs and tax relief, and the second would be education. Let me tell you why. When I knocked on over 5,000 doors when I first ran for delegate, it was very clear to me. The families, our retirees, our job creators, um, they were being challenged. They were talking about moving to Delaware, Virginia, to other states. And what we did with, with Larry Hogan's leadership, with, what we made as a priority is we have changed the shore and Maryland for the better. So we are doing better with job growth and with policies, with our budget decisions, with our tax relief. Uh, we need to keep on that track. I don't have a record of voting for eight O'Malley budgets in the past uh, when you had an opportunity to step up. I'm in a position now that I am a leader on this. Governor Hogan turns to me to be a leader on tax relief. I've been out there doing the doors again, and I'm hearing the same thing, particularly from our retirees. We need tax relief for all retirees. We made some progress under Governor Hogan's leadership for our military retirees, which I fully supported and sponsored, but we need to do more and we need to expand that. Education. My particular focus has been on career trade technology education. Let me tell you why. It's because I had our employers, our local employers who came to me and say, Mary Beth, there is a shortage of a skilled workforce. We need to strengthen the partnerships with the school systems. We need to put career trade technology in our schools so that we have people um, coming in our, from our school systems that will stay right here on the shore. And these are high-paying, high-tech jobs. That's what I'm focused on, and that's what I'll continue to work for and make it a priority in the state Senate. 
Our next question from Bill Chambers from the Salisbury Chamber, first to Delegate Carroza. Yes, uh, Delegate Carroza and Senator Mathias, among the issues that have loomed large over the last year is offshore wind. It seems that the two of you have taken slightly different positions on this issue. So please share with us your thoughts on offshore wind. Specifically, do you support the efforts to build wind turbines off the coast of Ocean City? And do you believe the presence of wind turbines will have a negative effect on real estate values and the number of visitors who will vacation in Ocean City? I believe a project of this magnitude has to have strong local support and that the major issues that have been brought up and concerns have to be addressed head on. I was not in the General Assembly when they went forward with this legislation for offshore wind. So I have spent a lot of time attending meetings, um, going to all the public meetings, attending meetings with all constituencies, those both supporting it and those against it. Here are my three major areas of concern where we don't have local consensus at this point. One is there is a major visibility issue that would impact Ocean City, and that impacts the shore and the whole state of Maryland because we do not want to jeopardize and risk one of our key economic drivers. We don't want, the, we don't want Virginia Beach running commercials and say, come to Virginia Beach and look at our pristine beaches and have the wind, uh, the wind turbines in view in Ocean City. And they will do that. It's a competitive advantage. Number two, the second area of concern is the uh, negative impact on our commercial fishing industry. Our commercial watermen finally got a say and got their own hearing uh, that the town of Ocean City allowed them to come in and voice their concerns. And they have major concerns. That's an industry that their backs are already up against the wall. And we have to fight for the traditions of those families. So when they say, that those uh, turbines are going to affect their livelihood. We have to take that seriously. And the third area is the true cost to ratepayers and to taxpayers. We have not determined that. I'm very, very concerned about the cost of that. Those three areas, those three issues, we need to hit them head on. And I can tell you right now, there is not local support and local consensus um, in those areas. Senator Mathias. Thank you. Well, I was on the Committee of Jurisdiction, and I'll try and do this very briefly. Uh, the bill was debated for three years, 2011, 12, and 13, the first year I was on the bill. Second year, I wasn't because we couldn't find consensus. In 2013, we found it. Tonight, uh, the mayor of Ocean City is here. I see a number of city council people. Uh, we worked to incorporate their concerns. We worked to incorporate the concerns of Assateague Island. We wanted to make sure that the landings weren't going to interfere. And uh, so after all that, and the bottom line is, ladies and gentlemen, the Public Service Commission, which is the quasi-judicial hearing group, had to find it was a net positive benefit for the ratepayers of Maryland. We capped the rates. We capped the rates at $1.50 for 1,000 kilowatt hours. We capped the rates for commercial users. Clearly, as we went forward, as that hearing went forward, our governors changed. You've heard this and you've heard those allegations why this bill came forward. It came forward for a better environment, to take the pressures off the grid. But when Governor Hogan, who I've worked extremely well with, came in, we thought maybe he wouldn't be for renewable energy. Guess what? When they took that vote at the Public Service Commission, there were four commissioners, they voted unanimously. Three of the four were appointed by Governor Hogan. So uh, as we've gone forward, I walked down the boardwalk shortly after that with the mayor, and he and I share a lot of things in common, but we are never gonna harm our community, any of our communities here. And I understand his concern, and I pledged him to work and find a working compromise. I believe it's right. I worked for renewable energy, and when you look at that uh, part on your bill, just remember the carbon emissions that we've offset. Please remember the goodness that we're bringing to the next generation here, our children, our clean air, our clean water, and I thank you so much, and I ask for your support. Our next question from Mike Dunn for Senator Mathias. Good evening. As state senator, you will be representing, obviously, all three Lower Shore counties. These next two questions, however, pertain to Somerset County. Our friends and neighbors in Somerset are still lagging behind the state and the region in terms of economic development and jobs. What specifically will you do as state senator to try and stimulate job growth in Somerset County? And the second part of this question has to do with ECI. As you know, work shortages there have caused mounting concerns for all involved. 
What are your thoughts on the current problems at ECI, and what steps will you take as state senator to improve the work shortage situation? Well, clearly, uh, first of all, we lift our friends up from Somerset County. I'm going to ask me respectfully, Mike, what, I've, what I will do. It's what I've done. Uh, what I've done is uh, Joe Getty, who was the chief legislative person for Governor Hogan before we convened a few legislative sessions ago before he went on to the highest court. We talked. I said, I am asking you to have Governor Hogan bring the assets of Maryland to lift our people up. More jobs for Marylanders happened on the bill, voted it. When Wacomico and I applaud the leadership, I see John Cannon here tonight. When they went ahead and did the subsidy bill for scholarships in Wicomico County, Somerset County came to me and said, can we make this happen? Can we make this happen for our people? Can we allow, you know, the tail that drags behind our, our students of higher education, uh, of, of tuition, of tuition debt? We put the bill in. Didn't look like the bill was going to work. Uh, after the hearing, I took uh, Dr. Hoy and the Somerset County Commission president. We called. I called Governor Hogan. He had his chief education folks come over. And guess what happened? First supplemental budget that year, we had the monies in to start the program. I'm happy to tell you it happened again last year. So we're moving forward. Vocational training, technical training. And I talked earlier about our cornerstone industries. When those onerous regulations were coming to poultry, to agriculture, to our commercial watermen, guess what? We were able to stand up. I've earned the respect in the majority of the Democratic caucus, and with all due respect, they listened to me to protect our people, not only in Somerset County, not only in Worcester County, not only in Wicomico County, but the entire Eastern Shore in the state of Maryland. We're all in this together. Delegate Carrozza. I'm really excited about the opportunity to represent Somerset County, and I do um, want to acknowledge the fact that Governor Hogan has made it as a, a priority as well, and I've used my position on the Budget Committee the past four years to protect the priorities of Somerset County in that budget. But we're looking forward. They are building a new TALS technology career school in Somerset County, and that is more than bricks and mortar, ladies and gentlemen. That is a vision of where we can take and lift the community where you have a school that's going to focus on these career trades, the shortage that we have with the skilled workforce. You know, now we're going to have a school in Somerset County. We can strengthen those partnerships. Um, I'm talking also about what we can do to make sure our commercial fishing industry and the seafood processing industry continues in Somerset County. You need good, sound budget and tax policies and that are focused on economic development. Governor Larry Hogan has made that a priority. I'm one of his key partners to pushing that forward, and that's why I'm so excited about representing Somerset County, and we're talking about local partnerships. I'll just give one example, Scotts Cove Marina, fourth generation uh, marina in Deal Island. Um, they're now expanding from their commercial into recreational boating. These are the type of businesses we have to support and make sure they thrive in the future, and I'm committed to working on it, making economic development, job growth a priority in Somerset County. Speaking of which... I'd like each of you to take uh, a little bit of time to talk about ECI and the current situation of ECI and uh, what steps as a state senator you would do to improve the work shortage situation there. Well, again, respectfully, Steve, it's not what I would do. It's what I have been doing. Uh, I've been urging Governor Hogan for at least the last two years uh, to get down there and figure out what our challenges and problems are. We heard from the trench. We heard that the polygraph test was onerous, that uh, when the folks passed the written test and they had uh, maybe the uh, passing grade was upwards of 70% or more and they took the polygraph, we had sometimes single, single digits that came out of there. Uh, we went and talked for two years. Talk, talk, talk. And guess what happened? I was coming up the road the day that they had the civil issue there. I went there. I watched the folks come out. I listened to them. Within three weeks, we had a meeting with Lieutenant Governor Boyd Rutherford, and now we're getting the job done. Absolutely. The shortage at ECI is a top priority, and it is an acute shortage. I believe the perfect storm happened there as far as you had the retiring correctional officers, you had the Delaware correctional officer that was killed um, at, at, um, in Delaware that stymied people wanting to go to work at ECI. So what are we focused on? Number one, we're focused on hitting that issue head on. You have to increase 
the number of correctional officers um, in order to stop the mandatory drafting and the mandatory overtime that they have. And second of all, you also need to protect your current correctional officers, and that's what I'm focused on. We need, need to make sure they have the step increases and that they have the retirement drop program, and we give them incentives. So those, the, those correctional officers that are hitting that 15 and 16 mark year mark, that they stay and continue to serve because we need them there. Thank you. Our next question from SU student Dorian Rogers for Delegate Carroza. As students, we are watching very closely the way in which political discourse across the country is on display, and many find it a bit dispiriting. In Annapolis, it can be it could appear as though some legislators are putting their political party and their political fortunes in front of the interests of the people they represent. What would you say to students to assure us that as a state senator, you will pl put the people's needs before the needs of your party? That's an excellent question. I can tell you from my door to door, day in and day out, that's exactly what the voters want. They want effective government and they want you to focus on the priorities and the solutions. And what we do with, under Governor Hogan's leadership, he, he has been able to work in a bipartisan way. I've been able to work in a bipartisan way. I'm a member of the House Appropriations Committee, and I've been able to get fair funding formulas and push other issues when the chairman is Maggie McIntosh from Baltimore City. So. So your question about um, the focus and the, the discourse is one where, number one, you have to understand the priorities of your own district, and then you have to have all the facts and prepare those facts in a way that you can make the strongest case, and that is done in a that is done in a bipartisan way, and you can be effective that way. That's the approach that I've taken to my public service. I'll be able to do even more in the state Senate as one of, 40, uh, one of 47, and I plan to continue to focus on the priorities and to fight for the shore. Senator Mathias. Well, thank you. Well, why don't we just start by telling the truth here tonight, and uh, how about leading by example? That works. How about two years ago when you went to your mailbox, and you started seeing uh, people's records that were distorted. When you start talking about, I heard a little earlier about this opioids and, and working together. Well, guess what? Did you see what happened this week? The overdose death rate has gone up another 15%. I stood strongly with Governor Hogan. You talk about bipartisanship. You talk about working together. I sponsored bills and we got them passed. A number of things we did, but yet the death rate still going up. We have some recovering folks in this room tonight. They didn't want to be criticized. You did not want to hear something about making a drug easier to get in your community than ice cream. So let's do this. We want to talk about being congenial. We want to talk about uh, certainly having a high tone. Let's start doing it here. Delegate Carosa. There is a clear difference on the issue of the heroin opioid epidemic and our approach to it. I have spent the last four years meeting with local opioid intervention teams in Worcester and Wicomico counties and just starting with Somerset County as well. I listen to what they think are the solutions at the local level. It's why I have supported treatment and recovery and peer recovery specialists. It's why I'm supporting Poplar Hill and Wicomico County where we're moving forward with uh, recovery, detox, treatment, recovery, and job skills. It's also why I strongly oppose the heroin injected sites at the community level paid by the taxpayers. All of my meetings, there is no local support for that. That's the wrong approach. Maybe it works in Amsterdam or New York City, but it does not work on the Eastern Shore of Maryland. I will continue to oppose those approaches, and I will support the solutions that are coming from our own local opioid intervention teams. Thank you. We'll move on. Uh, question from Bill Chambers. First to Senator Mathias. Following up on the previous question, we will now have a few questions about political relationships and alliances. According to polling, Governor Hogan, a Republican, is one of the most popular governors in the United States. As you know, he too is up for re-election in November. 
Both of you seem to be aligning yourself with our popular governor. First, we have a question for Senator Mathias. Then I'll have a slightly different question for you, Delegate Carroza. Senator Mathias, you're a Democrat who seems to be distancing himself away from the Democratic nominee for governor, Ben Jealous. Please explain. Well, clearly, I work with the people that are effective. If we're going to talk about relationships, let's talk about when uh, I was the mayor of Ocean City and the mayor of Mali was the mayor of Baltimore, and we both wound up in the legislature, and he was the uh, governor and I was the delegate. Guess what? When uh, that first session we were there, that special session, you know, another thing you read in your mailbox, I voted for all these taxes. That's untrue. It's not true. I voted against them. I was not in the pocket of, of the party. Clearly not in the pocket of the party. As we went forward, we can talk more. You know, our mayor is here tonight. You know, for years they debated gambling. And uh, I stood up and said no. It was set to go with my own Senate president. Do you think that was easy? No, it's not easy. Now, let's move forward. It's about the people of the Eastern Shore, with all due respect. As uh, Governor Hogan came along, and then we'll go back to the question, as he came along before he was even in office, he signed uh, the petition about school after Labor Day. Uh, the first month he was there, we went, the first day he was there, we were able to repeal the onerous phosphorus management tool regulations. Uh, now, with uh, the Democratic candidate, I've proven to be able to work with both Democrats and Republicans, but I've been able to make my relationship strong and continue to move forward for the people of the Eastern Shore. Uh, whether it's a Democrat, whether it's a Republican, that's not what I see when I go to work. I see getting the job done across the aisle. Delegate Carrozza, clearly you have the endorsement and support of Governor Hogan in this campaign, yet there is one area where you and the governor don't see eye to eye support for President Trump. Why do you see President Trump in a different light than the governor sees him? I do support President Trump, and I support President Trump because he is focused, like Governor Hogan, on jobs and the economy, and, he's, and I focus and I look at results. And when you look at what's going on in, on the shore, in Maryland, on this country, and you see the fact that unemployment is coming down and jobs are going up, and that's... That is at the leadership level, at the federal level, and that's also with Governor Hogan. So I actually, when I'm on the, when I'm out doing door to door, I talk about the fact that they're both both focused on that. And I can tell you, my constituents, they are seeing the positive effects of President Trump's leadership when it comes to the economy and when it comes to jobs. And we talked about Somerset County and why I'm so excited about it. Right now, Somerset County has an opening. You have a president and a governor, whether you voted for them or not, who are focused on jobs and the economy. This is Somerset County's opportunity to build those partnerships, to be lifted up, and I plan to be a key partner in making sure that we move Somerset County forward. Next question uh, from Mike Dunn for Senator Mathias. Senator, one of the criticisms leveled at the Maryland General Assembly is that the control of it by the Democratic Party, specifically by people like longstanding Senate President Mike Miller, hampers its effectiveness. What do you say to those who wonder whether your party and people like Senator Miller are part of the problem in Annapolis? Well, first of all, that's simply not true. And uh, when you look at the, in this very facility we're here tonight, when you, you heard about my eight budgets that I voted for, look at the positive benefits that came from that. Not every budget that we vote for, I agree with everything. Look at the dualization 113. Look at our facilities here. You know, when I sat and worked with the, President Miller in the Senate, and we talked, you heard me say about the PMT, the phosphorus management tool, you look at the philanthropy that's here on the shore from poultry and agriculture. We put that bill in to protect them. It wasn't going to go anywhere. I went to that Senate president. I traded on his institutional knowledge that showed me how to get the job done. And clearly there are times in committee that doesn't look like it's going that way, but he stands up. He stands by me. School after Labor Day, it didn't look like we were going to get that done. But uh, I went to Governor Hogan that first month he was there, talked about the executive order. We got it done, but guess what else? Not only did we get it done, it's been protected. You know who helped me protect it? President Miller. President Miller told those over in other counties and other parts of our state, this is about tourism. This is about what they need on the Eastern Shore. So when I go to work 
and I'm one of 33 in a Democratic caucus. I've sponsored bills with Republicans. You've heard me tonight of working positively and effectively with Governor Hogan. Governor Hogan will be there one more term, one more term most likely, but I go and I work with the 33. One Eastern Shore Senator, one rural ser Senator in Maryland, and they, I've earned their, I have clearly earned their respect and I'm able to bring home what we need here and vision our future together. It's not a liability, it's an asset for me. Next question, specifically for Delegate Carosa from Mike Dunn. Oh, Delegate Carosa, the flip side of that Democrat-controlled Maryland General, General Assembly comes a concern that if you're elected, your ability to be an effective senator and a chamber controlled by a powerful Democrat is hampered. How do you respond to that concern? I have been effective in every public service position that I've ever held. And if you look over the last four years, um, working as a delegate, working on the Appropriations Committee with Chairman Maggie McIntosh, as I mentioned before, I have taken some issues where the funding formulas have not been fair to the shore. And when you base your argument on fairness and you have the facts, in one case, um, many of you all know Peggy Bradford from the Mac Center. She came to me. She so showed us how the formula for the local senior centers were not fair, um, were not fair to the rural counties. I went and I took uh, a solution that Peggy Bradford, again, it was locally driven, um, that presented to, to the chairman. I'll never forget this conversation. Chairman McIntosh says, well, where did this come from? And I said, Peggy Bradford at the local level, I said she worked through this um, this formula, and she paused, and, and, and she said, well, you, she goes, you've got all the facts here. I respect Peggy Bradford. I've looked at this. I know that she's right on this, and she, we went forward with a uh, formula that was more fair to our senior centers here on the shore. Second issue, Warwick um, Community College and the funding for that. Um, there was another inequality with the formula that community colleges on the western shore were receiving a disproportionately higher amount than we were getting on the eastern shore. It just wasn't fair. So we made the case and we showed that. I want to give Dr. Hoy credit for that. He came up in person. We worked together and we persuaded both the western shore colleagues, legislators, and the chairman of the appropriations. And we made that funding formula fair for Warwick Community College. So those are examples. I will continue to be effective in my role as state senator. Thank you. Next question from Dorian Rogers, our Salisbury University student, first to Delegate Carosa. This is a straightforward and short question. What pieces of legislation do you plan to introduce in the next session of the General Assembly? Thank you for that question. And we've been spending a lot of time um, focused on the heroin opioid epidemic. And as the Senator mentioned, we still have a long way to go to reverse it. I believe any legislation that I introduce will come from the local level. Any pieces I have introduced in the past have come from the local level. So I specifically want to talk in this one area because I have spent some time and I have some folks that have come forward with the possibility. Very concerned about the families of the addicted. Right now, our privacy laws do not allow college officials to call the family if the student um, may be at risk of overdosing or their life at risk because of the strictness of our privacy laws. I want to work with the families because this is what they've requested. They want, they want to see if we can draw a very narrow exemption that if you have strict criteria and that student's life is at risk that we would be able to notify the families and perhaps save more lives. Again, I'm going to work with the locals. I'm going to make sure there's a coalition of support for it, but that's an example of the type of legislation that I would introduce. I really think you should only introduce legislation as a last resort. When I knocked on over 5,000 doors, my constituents, they weren't looking for a slew of new bills. What they were looking for was effective, limited, responsive government. But if it's the only way that we can change something, my approach would be to draw that legislation as narrow as possible so that way you have the most success in seeing it through. That's one issue that I plan to work on next session. Senator Mathias. Thank you. Uh, could I ask a show of hands? Do we have some retired state employees in here? Well, first of all, thank you for being here tonight. The number one bill I've already had drafted, actually three of them, is to restore your prescription drug benefit. 
Uh, I, I will have to admit to you, in 2011, as the state was emerging from the deepest uh, economic downturn since the Great Depression, action was taken at the end of that session to switch a Maryland state retiree from a private prescription plan funded by the state to Medicare Part D because of some affordable, some changes that were made during the Affordable Care Act. I wasn't aware of it, to be perfectly honest. I was not on the Committee of Jurisdiction. Uh, it went forward, and again, it was done in 2018. It was supposed to happen in 2020. The federal government moved it up a year. Uh, both my colleague and I, uh, in 2018, as we went through that BRFA, uh, we went ahead and took that action. It was wrong. The transparency did not exist. What you earned and committed yourself to was taken away from you, and uh, I talked to probably 75, almost 100 people who called on the phone. Not only did I, was the first person with all due respect that went to the Senate president, and he caucused with the governor and the speaker, and they were able to bring a temporary change that we go back. I also urged to those folks I talked to to get an injunction. I urged to get a class action suit, and I'm so pleased to see that that happened. I have, and I have pledged to those retirees to restore that benefit. Also. You see how important our politics are here tonight? I'm gonna to put in a bill that clearly will franchise, franchise our independent voters. We're not gonna leave you out in primaries anymore. We're all in this together. I'm gonna to work hard to bring our primary voters, our Democrats, our Republicans, and all of us together as Marylanders. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Next question from Mike Dunn, first to Senator Mathias. There's little doubt as to the importance of agriculture and the poultry industry here in the state of Maryland and on the Lower Shore. As our state senator, what proactive steps can you take to ensure that two of our most significant economic development engines remain viable in Maryland and on the shore? Well, we brought people to the table, and I have to tell you, about four years ago around this time, I was driving down Route 50, and I heard Jim Perdue say, we don't have a seat at the table. On NPR, I'm like, oh my God. I made a U-turn, I went back, I felt that we did, but uh, I started to look even deeper. We can't afford to lose our poultry industry and the associated agriculture industry, our crops, our grain, and when you look at the support businesses. That's what I already talked about, the phosphorus management tool, bringing people together. Do you know, uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, Alan Hudson and his wife and the reckless lawsuit that was brought and threatened their family and threatened the future of agriculture here on the state. We've stood up, we've earned that, we do. We have a stronger seat at the table by what, with all due respect, and you know, this doesn't have to be with, with uh, my colleague and I, a black or a white issue. If you look at our record, a lot of things we voted together for in the Eastern Shore delegation. Some of my members are here tonight. One thing we've always stood together on is agriculture, is poultry, our commercial watermen, and uh, we do it by accomplishment. We've been able to take that tension off the street and by being effective. And Governor Hogan has been a great partner, and so has the Democrats that I've earned their respect, and so has my colleagues, the Republicans. We're in this together for the future of the Eastern Shore. Thank you. Delegate Carrozza. Thank you. Very quickly on the state retired prescri prescription drug issue, I want to make clear that uh, Senator Mathias did vote for it in 2011. When it did come to light, some of us started working with Governor Hogan's administration from the very beginning. I'm, I have taken the approach of working through it, and I am going to make sure that those seniors who would be most impacted, they're the ones that we need to uh, take care of and make sure it doesn't have that huge increase. I am committed to working on that next session. I'm not prepared to get up and say a full reversal because quite frankly, I'm not gonna make a promise if I don't know if the funding is there. So my commitment to you is to say that those retirees who were uh, detrimentally impacted by it with a huge increase, we will address that next session. As far as agriculture and the poultry industry, Absolutely. It's one of our top economic drivers for the shore. We have to be aggressive in our approach, uh, not just voting the right way, but being aggressive about it. So whether when it was the phosphorus regulation, before I was even elected delegate as a candidate, I was out there fighting for that, working with Governor, working with then Larry Hogan even beforehand. And it was under Larry Hogan's leadership that that phosphorus regulation did get reversed and a more common sense regulation came into place. Number two, 
two, um, Senator Madalino's bill. Uh, this was his bill on the um, so-called Community Health Air Act. This is a bill that would have disastrous consequences for the eastern shore of the poultry industry. I was working with the Delmarva poultry industry during the interim to figure out a strategy of how we were going to kill that bill. That was before we were even in session. So it's not just a matter of voting the right way. It's a matter of fighting and the advocacy for it. And one last point is ag education. I've been on the fa family farms. They want to pass them on to the next generation. They're telling me that you need ag education, hands-on farming in the schools to make sure we can pass those farms and keep them on the shore. Thank you. Next question from Dorian Rogers. We'll begin first to Delegate Carroza. Education is again a hot button issue. This is a question specific to Wacomico County. As you know, Wacomico's public schools rank next to the bottom in state in per pupil funding by county or local contribution. As you also know, Wacomico County has a revenue cap. We have heard over the years that your fellow legislators in Annapolis think Wacomico County has to do more to help itself if it wants more help from Annapolis. We know education funding is a local issue, but what role do you think a state senator can play in this issue? Thank you, and I'm glad that you have the education question as a priority issue. I want to first talk about the work that I've been doing with the Kerwin Commission. The Kerwin Commission is going to come out and make recommendations on the funding formulas for the entire state, but even more so, it's going to look at some major policy areas, whether it's pre-K funding across the board, whether it's boosting career trade technology education, whether it's raising teaching as a profession. So even though I was not appointed that commission, I took my own time and my own money to go up to Annapolis and attend those meetings because it's so important or how we had. When you bring that home to Wicomico County, we are having a very serious discussion right here locally. I applaud the leadership of the Greater Salisbury Committee, the Salisbury Chamber of Commerce for taking a leadership role on basically taking education to the next level under Dr. Hanlon's leadership of where we need to go. I do believe that we're going to have to have some tough conversations about funding. I think that's where the Kerwin comes in. I'm not going to overpromise when it comes to funding. What I am going to say is I'm going to fight and make sure why Comico County gets its fair share of education. And I will focus on those career, those, uh, those areas that I mentioned, career trade technology education, fair funding for the shore, and to make sure teaching is raised as a profession so we keep our best teachers in the classroom. Senator Mathias. Well, th thank you, and uh, we all know the importance and the future vision of education. But, you know, what we may not know here is the operating budget, operational budget in Wicomico County, 70% from the state. Now, how did that come to pass? You know, so when you talk about reevaluating the funding formula, let's talk about where we were. Uh, my colleague, my former colleague, Norm Conway, uh, he was told by leadership, why Comico County has to bring up their taxing effort. He brought up the piggyback tax. That wasn't easy to do, and that may be one of the reasons why he's not here tonight. But I can assure you right now, the benefit continues to go forward. I too have been involved with the Kerwin Commission. I took the opportunity to look at where we're going forward, but the bottom line is uh, when we bring the monies back home, we have to make certain that we here are doing our part. I too say to the Greater Salisbury Committee, to the Salisbury Chamber, and to you, sir, that uh, we have to do our part because you know what? That is our future. So uh, the funding formula, I'm not so sure how much higher we can go than 70%. That's pretty significant. If somebody was gonna have an argument tonight about a funding formula, it might be Worcester County. Our Worcester County commissioners are here, and uh, it's the second lowest funded state uh, education contribution in the state, Worcester County. So, uh, you know, we are gonna work together. We're gonna make certain that that Kerwin Commission addresses the needs and the issues, but we have to put our efforts on the table as well. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our final question from the panelists this evening from Bill Chambers uh, from the Salisbury Chamber for first Senator Mathias. Senator Mathias, we want to ask now about the mandatory leave bill known as House Bill 1. It was controversial when passed 
and controversial again when the legislature overrode Governor Hogan's veto of it. Many Eastern Shore businesses believe the bill is harmful to them. What actions, if any, beyond the tax credit passed in the 2018 General Assembly session will you support moving forward? Well, clearly, let's talk about what we did. And uh, I stood in front of uh, the business community in Ocean City two years ago and said, this bill is going to pass. It's going to pass. Tell me what it is uh, that you can uh, bring forward to us to allow you to work with that bill. They talked about 120 days, which I remain committed to. When the bill, the bill came out of the house. The bill came out of the house with 90 days, 90 days. The bill came out of the house where you can earn up to seven days. Earn, by the way, not give, earn. The bill came out of the house where you could start to earn with four hours. When the bill came, modestly, to my committee, I was able to change all that already from 90 days to 106, from four to eight hours, reduce the right to action. Take what was really onerous to our business community and make it more affordable. We knew it was going to happen. And when you give your word at the table, ladies and gentlemen, that's when you earn trust, when you earn trust. After we earn trust and mitigated that bill, we came back, as you've already talked about, is with the tax credit. We came back, and I pledged to come back to take that 106 days. We have a 14-day doctor's note, but to get it to be a solid statutory 120 days. I'm continuing to move forward, but the benefits, the benefits across the whole state of what we can do, what we're doing to grow our businesses, to make certain not everyone, with all due respect, and I have the highest, I'm a business guy, have the highest respect for business, but not everyone owns a business. We have our employees that are on the line that need that, that are sick themselves. Their moms and dads, their children are sick. And when they earn that benefit, they are deserving of that benefit, and I stand by that. Thank you. <laughs> Delegate Carosa. With all due respect, if you were going to support that bill, which you did and voted for it, and you voted to override Governor Hogan's veto, you should have gotten the 120-day seasonal exemption. I introduced that three years in a row, 2016, 17, and 18. We were, it was very clear what the Ocean City Chamber of Commerce and our business uh, small business operators were saying they needed that. And so if, if you were going to vote for it, which you did, you should have at least gotten the 120 days. And let me tell you something. I just spent, I was just on a small business tour throughout all three counties, starting at, with the hospitality industry, at the carousel, moving to DiCarlo Precision Instruments in Wicomico County, Taylor's Barbecue in uh, Salisbury, and then down to Southern Connections in Crisfield, our seafood processing. And they are so so concerned about all the onerous regulations that are still on them at the federal and the state level. I come from a small business family. I don't know how we would ever have operated Beefies having all these regulations on us at the federal and state level. So when we talk about what you're going to do, we're going to go back and we're again during this interim period figure out what we can do and get some relief, whether it's the 120 days which we'll continue to push for, and get some relief so we can have a common common sense paid sick leave policy. We should have taken Governor Hogan's proposal, which was bipartisan, and moved forward with it. Instead, they ramrodded this proposal that's disastrous for our small business operators. And all you have to do, ladies and gentlemen, is just go out and talk to the small business, family businesses that are impacted that, who are providing the jobs. So let's keep in mind, these are the folks that are providing the jobs. So we have to have good common sense policies. That's what I will fight for in Annapolis. Thank you, Delegate Carosa. Round of applause for our questions tonight from our panelists. Well done, gentlemen. Good job. Well done. We do have, we do have time for a few uh, questions from the audience, so we'll go first to Delegate Carosa. Uh, is affordable care affordable? If not, what will you do to lower the cost of health care? Two minutes. 
Thank you. Um, Health care is a top issue for the shore and for the state of Maryland. And I can tell you when I go and do my door to door, the two top issues are tax relief for retirees and the cost and affordability of health care. So what are we doing about it? Governor Hogan, again, has taken a leadership role. Uh, he just moved forward with a reinsurance program because insurance rates were about to go up by 50 percent in a bipartisan way. He passed that legislation through and um, and we're and we're able to get some handle on the cost. We have to do more next session. He's committed to doing that. Number two, and what I want to talk about is the opportunity for health care. On the, on the shore here, we have a disproportionately higher senior population. And so that's, an oppor that's a challenge because we have to provide quality, affordable health care services. But ladies and gentlemen, it's an opportunity because health care can be one of our major economic drivers for the shore. When you talk about the shortage of primary doctors and specialists and nurses and think that we have we can have a pool right here on the shore. So I look at it as not only do we have the challenge of making sure we have affordable, accessible health care, which I'm committed to working with our local partners and with Governor Hogan to address those issues, but it's a tremendous, tremendous opportunity um, to have our young people stay here on the shore um, in, an, in an exciting field in the health care industry. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Mathias. Thank you. Uh, folks, maybe you all know what reinsurance is, but what reinsurance is is when you buy a policy for a bigger loss. And uh, when the changes were starting to happen and the Affordable Care Act was being taken apart after being uh, attempted to be repealed 50 times and standing in the Supreme Court uh, up upholding it, uh, what started to happen was piece by piece uh, we were taking the affordance away. That's when, and we saw the volatility. You didn't see the volatility in the large groups. I happened to be on that committee of jurisdiction, and I don't want to talk, you know, like it's everyday language. You didn't see the volatility in the large groups or the medium groups. Where you saw the volatility was in the individual market. It was out of control. And as my colleague talked about, you were looking at premiums that were going to increase by 50%. That's when we came together in a bipartisan way earlier, that's what I said. This is not about uh, a tennis match, this side or that side. This is about coming to the middle. That's how we found reinsurance. But we needed money to pay for it. When they took the monies away from the federal side, our governor, our House, and our Senate came together for an assessment. They came together to put an assessment in place to generate revenue. Revenue to hold down the spiking in the individual market and also to be able to buy this reinsurance for catastrophic illnesses. That's what we have been able to do. That is what it's like and we can both stand up here gladly and smile because we have a common goal and that is you. That is your health and that is when we all work together at the table. Both of those bills were signed not both of us voted for both of those bills, but I could tell you they were both signed. Thank you very much, and we'll continue to give you that good work. All right, thank you. We have time for one more question. First to you, Senator Mathias. Yes. Uh, you both spoke about high-paying, high-tech jobs for the shore. Can you talk about the specific ways you would encourage these jobs to come to the shore? Well, first of all, I can respectfully say to you, uh, you've already heard tonight about our technical schools and the next generation. Uh, I've seen out here farm families, and the, the farm is changing. And when you look at the technology that's on the farm, making sure that our next generation learns that technology. And we have to understand that a vocation requires compensation. I already talked to you about you know, protecting the cornerstone industries, but uh, just last week, again, I've already mentioned it once, I was down Wallops Island. They cut the ribbon on a new command center down there. We, we go ahead and supply the International Space Station right from here, and half of those jobs are Maryland jobs. Half of them are Maryland jobs. We've talked a lot. I think my colleague and I have talked more about Governor Hogan tonight than we've talked about ourselves. <laughs> if you want the truth. And I think he's having a good night, don't you, delegate? Are you so, going to vote for so, him? So, so my point is, guess what? When he brought that $40 million tax credit for Northrop Grumman, I stepped right up. 
when my friends, uh, you want to call them to the left or you want to call them progressive, said, that's, that's corporate welfare. I said, absolutely not. That's tens of thousands of jobs. And before I voted, I went to the administration and said, as we grow in wallops, I want to make sure Northam Grumman that just bought Orbital is going to grow for our people. We can go on communications, 5G. You know, the world we know it today, uh, it's all about shared use. Uber. So many things that we are growing towards for tomorrow, and I'm going to make certain on the committee of jurisdiction that I'm here to make sure it happens for us, for our next generation, so those families can be together in the kitchen on Sunday and grow forward for the strength of the Eastern Shore. Thank you. <laughs> Delegate Carosa. I'm excited about the opportunities where we can grow, and there are several areas. Uh, one, I mentioned the whole health care industry, so that's why I was meeting with the leadership of PRMC and with AGH and the other community providers to see how we can now make health care an, another one of our economic drivers. Um, there's also, um, Governor Hogan went through with the More Jobs for Maryland's Acts. Now, why Comico County this past year is now included in that. I think the follow-up on that is just as important as passing those bills because the follow-up is to make sure that we are going out making sure existing companies know of this opportunity, these tax credits, within, when they provide so many more new jobs that they're eligible for these tax credits. So the follow-up is very important on that. And of course, you've heard me talk about the construction industry. I was in office in um, April of 2015. I had just been elected um, uh, in 14, and I was asked to come over, and I, I had the construction industry employers just pleading for a more skilled workforce. So there's so much more we can do. It's one of the reasons why I went over to DiCarlo Precision um, Instruments this um, past week is to find out what else we can be doing because they are affected by that job shortage. And so it means that we have to stay focused on the economic development policies that do come from Governor Hogan that we should be supporting and we should be making sure that whatever we move forward with, that the locals are taking advantage of it. So I, be I believe this is an exciting time. The window is open. And I especially want to make sure that Somerset County takes advantage of that as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to wrap things up. One minute, closing statements from each. We'll begin with you, Senator Mathias. Well, thank you, and I'm so proud to be here with you tonight. And again, you look around. We are the Eastern Shore. I respectfully said who I am. I'm one of you. I'm with you. And everything that we do uh, affects me just like you. My lovely daughter is in the front row, and uh, although she's sitting in one seat, she's with baby. And... Uh, Little baby, our mouth to God's ears will be here in, uh, in mid-January, and I'll look out, and I know how many, many of you have grandchildren and children and look forward to a very bright future. I asked you tonight to continue to be with me as we go together. I ask you for your confidence and your trust. Why, Comico County, we've worked together with an elected school board. They fought and asked. Worcester County, we've been able to find and bring back in Worcester County the free market to the alcohol industry. Ocean City has money that's already pre-authorized for that next phase of the convention center, and we've talked tonight about Somerset County, which is our commitment and my commitment to make stronger and better. I ask you for your vote, and thank you for being here tonight. Thank you, Senator. All right, Delegate Carosa. This election is about the future for the shore. I believe everything, all of my life experiences have taken me to this point to step up for the shore. I believe that coming from a small family business where I learned my faith and my work ethic from my parents and seeing also the challenges they face and taking that personal experience and now fighting for our small business operators, our job creators. My experience in working for other elected officials where I learned the importance of constituent service, being at the Pentagon on 9-11, how important we always have to put public safety. And so what I'm hearing from my constituents when I go door to door, they want somebody who will fight for the shore. That's what I intend to do. That's what I've been doing. And I can be an even stronger voice for the shore in the state Senate. Thank you very much. Let's give them both a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming out again. Thanks to the Greater Salisbury Committee, the Salisbury Chamber of Commerce, and PACE here at Salisbury University. Mm -hmm.